Today we are going to look at a Bible story that probably one could say would describe a pretty good day in, in the life of Jesus. And in this story, uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating. The context really illustrates how Jesus is now hitting his stride. His popularity is off the charts. The public's view of Jesus is at an all-time high. And really what makes this story particularly interesting is how Jesus responds to the applause that is being directed his way. You know, for most of Jesus' ministry uh, up until this point in time, whenever people would kind of applaud him or give him any kind of uh, props, Jesus would, was quick to deflect it. But as we're going to see here in today's conversation, Jesus really is uh, quick to, to um, receive it. In fact, I encourage you to notice how Jesus makes this very bold declaration, the declaration that he is king. Jesus is king, which has profound implications for your life and mine. And so today I've titled our conversation, King Jesus. King Jesus. And so I'm going to start reading at verse 28. If you have a, a Bible open, you can follow it with me or uh, watch on screen. Uh, the verses will be there as well. And try, as always, try to picture the scene in your mind. This is what we read. After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into the village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying the, that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said, and sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. It's almost like a secret password. The Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. Now here in this Bible story, let's stop here for a second. Here in this Bible story, we're told that Jesus is entering Jerusalem. Now, you might recall that earlier in this chapter, Jesus had just had a lunch, if you will, with a tax collector, a guy by the name of Zacchaeus, who lived in the town of Jericho. And if you were here a few weeks ago, you would, uh, you'll remember how I shared how Jer or Jericho was like 18 miles from Jerusalem. And now we're told that Jesus is, is in the town of Bethany, verse 29, which is two miles from Jesus. So Jesus is getting close to the end. We know if you fast forward, Jesus is about ready to go to the cross. Um, he's, he's about ready to shed his blood for the sins of humanity for you and me. And so Jesus is only two miles from, from the deal, which is the whole purpose for why he came. And so he's got his game face on now. Jesus is in, is in kind of a game mode because he recognizes that the cross is looming. looming. And so here in this story in Luke... The Bible writer describes how Jesus directs two of his disciples to enter a village to secure this young donkey colt that's never been ridden. Jesus instructs them that in the event that they encounter any kind of opposition, that they're to tell the owners of this colt that the Lord needs it, right? It's like this secret password. It's like this prearranged conversation uh, that Jesus, I'm suggesting, had with these, these owners. And so we're told that sure enough, as they go and they, they, they quickly, you know, go to get this colt, the owners change their tune, if you will, and they release this virgin colt into the disciples' care. And in so doing, I propose they showcase a truth that has relevance for your life and mine. And so write this down, point number one, in your app notes. Jesus is working even when I am unaware Jesus is working even when I am unaware. You know, in this Bible story, I love how Jesus, you know, he, he instructs these disciples to look for this colt that's going to be tied to this hitching post, that he is aware, that Jesus is aware, that's never been ridden before. And what this tells us is that Jesus has a prearranged agreement with this owner to borrow the colt. 
Jesus obviously has other relationships that the disciples are unaware of, or at least in this case, these two disciples that Jesus sends on this mission are unaware of. And what this illustrates for us, I think the transferable concept for you and me is the truth that God has a kingdom agenda which he is forwarding and he simply invites you and me to participate in it. Friends, Jesus is working behind the scenes. Let that truth, let that reality sink in. Jesus is working behind the scenes. So ponder this. Have you ever felt discouraged when it seems like Jesus isn't answering your prayers? You know, do you ever feel frustration when it seems like God isn't doing anything? Friends, this Bible story with this young donkey colt showcases for us that Jesus is often at work, but many times we just don't see it. Many times we are unaware of it of Jesus's activity. And I wonder if any of us here today are tuning in online, if that's a message that some of us need to hear today. So let's say a prayer together, okay? We're gonna say a couple prayers more today before we leave our campus. And this, we'll call this a prayer of gratitude. So once again, I encourage you to put the palms open of your hands. It's a, it's a posture of receptivity. Let's just take a deep breath in again. Take a deep breath in, hold it. Now exhale. Good. Now pray this prayer in your heart. Say, thank you, Jesus, that you are at work even when I'm unaware. Thank you, Jesus, that you are active behind the scenes. Good. Okay. Point number two. Write this down. Jesus instructs... <clears throat> Specific assignments to, to specific individuals. Jesus instructs or entrusts specific assignments to specific individuals. You know, you're probably all pretty tired of hearing me talk about this point, but it is a repetitive theme throughout the scriptures. You know, the Bible teaches and it illustrates for us here in this donkey experience how we all have roles to play in God's kingdom agenda. Now think about this. Is it safe for us to assume that the owners of this donkey colt, which Jesus borrowed, is it safe for us to assume that they were specifically tasked with the responsibility to perhaps raise this cult and maybe even protect this cult? I mean, look at verse 33. They ask the question, why are you untying the, our cult? It tells us or suggests for us that they've got this eye on this cult. They're, they've been raising this up. No one's ever ridden it before. Jesus, is, I suggest, has probably had this prearranged, you know, conversation, you know, I don't know in the Midwest a lot of times, sometimes, and maybe even here, but you will, you will pay a farmer to raise a, a cow. So when it comes time to, to harvest it, you, you fill your freezer with meat, right? I'm suggesting in a similar way, Jesus prearranged with these owners to raise this cult for the special mission that Jesus knew that he would one day be called to fulfill. Now think about this. How important is it for Jesus to ride this young colt into Jerusalem that day. Spoiler alert, it was very important. You know, I wonder how different this story would have read if instead of going to the village to secure this colt for Jesus, which he requested, if these disciples instead went to grab some pita bread and maybe a falafel lunch at one of the local street vendors. You think the story would read any different? How important was this colt untying assignment for Jesus's legacy mission? Would you write this down, letter A, in your app notes, for those of you taking notes? Every assignment in God's kingdom agenda matters. Every assignment, letter B in God's kingdom agenda, has value. 
Every assignment matters. Every assignment, kingdom assignment, has value. Brothers and sisters, look up here for a second. Look at me for a second. Do you want to grow in your relationship with God? Then do the little things well. The little things every day will help you grow in your trustworthiness. Be trustworthy with the little things. You know, listen, we all have kingdom assignments to fulfill. And the truth of this story illustrates how some of the assignments that God gives to you and me are behind the scenes that nobody's even aware of. They're just as important as those that are on the stage, that are public. Listen, I think one takeaway of this, this Bible story for you and for me is the encouragement not to be seduced by the appeal of what, I, what we might call public ministry. Jesus entrusts specific assignments to specific individual, individuals. Why? Because every role is important. Did you know that statistically, and I know I've talked about this before, and so this may be rehashed for many of you, but did you know that statistically, a first-time guest to a church service like ours will make their decision whether they're going to return a second time within the first 15 minutes of arriving on campus. Did you know that? So long before the band finishes their set, their worship set, long before I get, a, get up and stand before you and lead you in a conversation or prayer, long before any of that happens, a person's already made their decision whether or not they're going to come back for a second time. So what influences their decision? Well, for starters, how hard is it to find a parking place? You ever gone on the mall and driven, right? Looking for that parking space? People can't park, they're probably not going to come back. Big deal. Next thing is, where are the bathrooms? How hard are they to find? Are they easy to find, hard to find? And when they do find them, are they clean or are they dirty? Or when I walk on campus, how am I greeted? Am I greeted? Do, I, am I, do people, are they friendly? Do they shake my hand? Do they ask my name? Are they interested in me or do they kind of, are they standoffish? Paul Marvis, are you friendly or are, you, or are we standoffish? You know, for those who have parents, those families who have kids, one of the questions they want to know is, do I, is there a good vibe here for my kids? Will my kids be safe, right? Will they be welcomed or will they be seen as a, a nuisance? Will they be nurtured? That's what families want to know when they walk on campus. First impressions, behind the scenes ministries are so important as we read here in our Bible story. Friends, Jesus needed this coal to showcase and visually demonstrate the nature of his kingdom, which was one of service, not arrogance. You know, in biblical days, an ass or a donkey was the mount of choice for a merchant, for a, a, a priest, for a, a person, a man of peace. And so Jesus, riding this young colt, is extremely intentional as he comes into Jerusalem that day. We know that a king in, in, in that day and age would often ride a mighty war horse, you know, uh, but generally that was only during times of war. It wasn't uncommon for a king during times of peace to, to ride on a, a young colt as we see here, as, as Jesus using uh, that for his mode of transportation. And so what may seem like an insignificant ministry assignment, the raising of a colt or the transferring of a colt from point A to point B, it wasn't. Jesus needed this colt to send this important message to his audience that his kingdom was going to be characterized by peace. Reinforcing this truth that every kingdom assignment that God gives to you and me is important. Every ministry kingdom assignment that he gives to you and me has value. So brothers and sisters, don't ever underestimate the value of shaking somebody's hand, looking in, in the eye and saying hello. Why? Because it could change the trajectory of a person's journey. So let's keep reading. Let's finish out our story in this conversation. Verse 35. 
So the disciples brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord, they cried. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And Jesus replied, If they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into chairs. Now write this down, point number three in your app notes. Jesus unapologetically embraces his own legacy assignment. Jesus unapologetically embraces his own legacy assignment. You know, here in these, this Bible story, we can read how Jesus instructs his disciples, right, to get a colt for him to ride on. Now, Jesus knows what the implications are of riding a colt into Jerusalem, of what that would imply. You know, centuries earlier, the prophet Zechariah in the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 10, foretold that the Messiah would be, would be deemed the Prince of Peace. That would be his label. And so Jesus knew that to ride a young colt into Jerusalem at the time of the Passover celebration, where there would be millions upon millions upon millions of people, the, the, the city would be exploded like three times bigger than normal. Jesus knew that the Jewish worshipers would correctly interpret what Jesus was claiming. Friends, in this one action, Jesus knew that they would understand that Jesus was claiming to be the promised Messiah. Jesus was claiming to be king. Jesus knew that to ride into Jerusalem on a young colt, a young colt, he would be basically center stage. Every eye would be upon him. No secrecy here, no back street, back alley entrance here. No, this is center stage. His entrance was full fanfare. The limelight was on and shining bright. William Barclay, who is a well-known Bible scholar, writes, and I quote, It is impossible to exaggerate the sheer courage of Jesus. Unquote. It is impossible to exaggerate the sheer courage of Jesus. Why? Because at this point in Jesus' ministry, there was a price on his head, wasn't there? Jesus knew that the religious elite, the Jewish religious elite, they wanted him dead. They wanted him silenced. But even though Jesus knew this, even though that Jesus knew riding on this colt would put all eyes on him, he didn't back down from his own mission. Jesus unapologetically embraced his legacy assignment. The disciples were told, Throw their garments over this young colt. Why? Well, I don't know if you've ever done any bareback riding, uh, which means that you ride without a saddle. But if you have, you likely understand why the disciples threw their coat over the back of this young donkey. Most of you probably know this, but my parents tell me that I was riding a horse before I was walking, literally. And so most of my young life and up through my college years and young adult life prior to moving out here to California, I've spent thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours riding horses and mules and donkeys. I've ridden cows. I've ridden a couple of sheep, you know, depending on my age. I've, I've ridden it all, ridden it all. And if there's one thing that you know about riding bareback without a saddle animals is that your pants are going to get dirty. Whatever the point of contact of your body is on an animal, it's going to get messy. Your legs are going to be, they're going to have sweat stains on the inside of your legs and on your butt and maybe on your calves if you're, you know, reaching around the bottom of the animal. 
If you ride for very long, when you get off, besides having these big, thick, wet, kind of dirty stains, you're going to have animal hair stuck to you, stuck to your clothes. We know from the story in the Bible when Jesus was, was crucified, which we're going to read here on Easter Sunday morning coming up here just in a week or two. We know that the Bible says that when they took his clothes, he had wore the, like this one-piece garment. You remember that passage in Scripture? And so Jesus must have had like a one-piece robe. And I'm just simply saying the disciples threw their cloaks over the back of this young donkey. Why? Because they wanted to keep Jesus' clothes clean. Are you with me? Next, we're told, don't miss this. The Bible writer tells us in verse 36 how the crowds spread out their garments. The crowds, it's really important. The crowds spread out their car garments on the road. In essence, they're giving Jesus what? What you would call what? The red carpet treatment, right? Like Hollywood. This is where he's going to be coming. The king is coming, people recognize. The king is coming. Let's go. Let's get the red carpet out there. He is coming. But notice what we're told, what the followers do in verse 37. We're told that they begin to do what? They sing and shout. Are you with me? They sing and shout. That's what we're told here. We're also told that the, in this Bible story how the Pharisees, these religious teachers, these religious leaders of that day are upset with the fact that the kid, that, that the kids, that, that the people are singing and shouting and, and what they're witnessing. And so they address Jesus as teacher, which is an interesting uh, title, if you will. I mean, they hate Jesus and yet they're giving him this, this title of respect, so to speak, asking him to tell the people to stop. Rebuke your followers, they say. To which Jesus responds, nah, if the people stop shouting, he says the rocks are going to cry out. If the people keep quiet, even every stone along the road will burst into cheers. And friends, in this moment, in Jesus' response, he is declaring that he is the Messiah, isn't he? He is declaring that he is worthy of our worship, which he would soon back up and just a matter of days by shedding his blood on the cross for you and for me and for raising, from by raising from the dead to defeat death and sin. You know, to use a baseball analogy, Jesus is bringing the heat, brothers and sisters. Jesus wanted the Pharisees to know, he wants you and me to know that he is king, that no amount of negativity can circumvent his power. So his followers, they shout and they sing. Now what I'm about to propose, I've never heard anybody talk about before. What I'm about to suggest, I've never read or had anybody read, write this. And so you can take it for what it's worth. But this past week, as I was digging into this passage of scripture, the Holy Spirit nudged me. I just kept thinking, there's something here that I'm not getting. There's something here that I'm not getting. There's something here for like three days. There's something here that I'm not getting. And what I'm about to tell you, it's going to be a Mike Decker perspective, and you can take it or leave it, but I think I'm spot on. I believe this to be true. Do y'all remember the story in the Bible called the Battle of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6? In the Old Testament portion of the Bible, there's a story where God tells Moses, this, this, this Israelite Jew, this, this, to go into Egypt to deliver the Israelites, the nation of Israel, from slavery and then lead them to a place that God had promised them, a land where they would live known as the promised land. Well, in Joshua chapter 6, we're told about a story where as the Israelites are just kind of getting their stuff together, they encounter their they're sort of their first battle uh, assignment where they come upon this, this town called Jericho that's surrounded by white walls. You remember that story? Read it if, if, you're, if it's not familiar to you. And in God's instruction to sort of demonstrate to his people that he is king and he is large and in charge, he said, here's all I want you to do. For seven days, I want you to walk around the city walls. 
The people are to be quiet. They're not to raise their voice. They're not to say anything. So day one, just simply walk around the, the, the city walls and have the, 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 the priests blow their ram's horn. Are you with me? So day one, the people march. The people anticipate. And then they return to camp and they wait on God. They too, the people walk in silence. They anticipate. Then they go back to camp and they wait on God. Day three, day four, day five, day six, the people walk once around the city. They march. They anticipate God's going to do something. Then they go back to camp and they wait on God. But then day seven comes. You know what happens on day seven, right? This time God says, I want you to walk. Have the people walk around the city seven times. It's day seven. We're going to walk around the town, this town, seven times. And on the seventh time, I want you, the first six times, I want them to do what they've been doing the last six days. I want them to walk and march and anticipate in silence. The, the, the priests are to, to you know, blow their ram's horn. But on the seventh time, after the seventh time, they're to shout. They're to sing and they're to shout. That's what we're told. And so the seventh time around, as the people march, the priests sound their horns. Joshua says, shout for the Lord has given this day, this you, the city. And so the sh people shouted and the people sang and the priests blew their horns. And what happens? The Bible describes how God unleashes his power, doesn't he? The walls of Jericho come tumbling down. The people are defeated. And brothers and sisters, in this single display of obedience... God demonstrated to the Israelite nation that he was a king who they could trust. Now fast forward to Jesus. When Jesus' followers here in Luke chapter 19 began to shout and sing as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, what I propose that the people were declaring is their hope that Jesus would be a king and leader who would break down the walls in their life. Are you with me? You do know, don't you, that Jesus still has the power to break down walls? Personalize this. Where in your life do you want to experience God's power? What walls or barriers or addictions do you need Jesus to crumble? You know, there are people in my social world, and I suspect in yours too, who are facing a serious medical challenge. A medical challenge that they're being told is dire. Life-threatening. Listen, I believe that God uses doctors and nurses to advance his kingdom agenda to help you and me to be healthy. That being said, even the best medical treatment cannot trump Jesus' power and authority. Why? Because Jesus is king. And when he is in conquering mode, there's no amount of doctor's negativity or forecast, unfavorable medical forecast that can circumvent Jesus. Jesus is king, which is why we should and we can lean into him for his power when facing medical strongholds. You know, do any of you have a work obstacle that you're up against? Anybody here or tuning in online facing any kind of an employment issue? Maybe you need a break, breakthrough. Will you dare to believe that Jesus cares about your work stuff? Friends, Jesus is king. You know, for the last month or two, Joseph Goudinho has been playing his guitar up here on, on stage and he, as he did today. 
Joseph is in the uh, eighth grade uh, here in, goes to Ensign, right, Joseph? Uh, m- middle school here in uh, Co- Costa Mesa, Newport Beach area. And recently, Joseph expressed his desire to his parents, or expressed to his parents the desire that he wanted to go to Pacifica High School, which is a private Christian school in our area that has a small tuition of $24,000 a year. Well, Beto and Millie don't have that kind of money to send their son to a high school, but as a family, do you know what they do have? They have Jesus. Jesus. And they got a whole lot of faith. And so although finances pose a seemingly impossible barrier, when you got Jesus on your team, no money, no problem. So Joseph applied. He said, you know what, I'm going to do my part. And I'm going to trust that Jesus, if he wants to, he can do his part. And so after several interviews and multiple community references and a whole lot of prayer, and, or a whole lot of, I guess, really prayer, combined with a whole lot of faith and hope and leaning on Jesus, anybody want to venture a guess as to whether or not the school came back to Joseph and offered him a scholarship where he could go to school almost for tuition free? What do you think? Friends, Amen. Friends, does Jesus care about our educational endeavors? You do it. No, he does. Would you say out loud on on the count of three, Jesus is king. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. Do you believe that or are those just words? Again, on the count of three, Jesus is king. You ready? One, two, three. Jesus is king. He is king. That's why we sing and we shout. That's why the people sing and shout. Jesus, we're told in Matthew, the gospel of Matthew writes how Jesus once preached this message in Matthew chapter 11. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, heavy burdened, he said, and I will give you rest. Translation, Jesus invites us to lean on him. Jesus invites us to worship him. Jesus invites us to cling to him for strength. That's why I believe That when Jesus' followers sang and shouted, they believed that Jesus is a king who can break down strongholds and seemingly insurmountable walls. And so, brothers and sisters, like the people in Jerusalem who raised their voice as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on his donkey, will you too, will I too, give Jesus my focus and praise? Why? We should. Why? Because he is king. He is the king of kings. And he has the authority to break down and crumble, what? Walls. So let's go to prayer. Time's about up here. Let's close our conversation with prayer. Put everything down, loosen your arms, you know, shake the tension out of your shoulders if there's anything there. David's going to come up and join me. Put your palms open again. Close your eyes just to block everything out. Not that there's anything spiritual in keeping your eyes closed or praying with your eyes closed, but just center down. And I want you to, just in your own mind, answer this question. What walls do you need Jesus to break down? What miracles do you want to lay before Jesus today? So with an open hand and an open heart and an open mind, pray this. Say, Jesus, I lay before you today and you fill in the blank. Jesus, I lay before you today Jesus, the people sang and shouted because they understood that you have power, supernatural power to do what no man or woman, boy or girl can do. And 
So Father, today I pray for those of us who are here and tuned mind, who have in our life what feels like an insurmountable wall. That as we sit with you in this moment in silence, that we're sort of marching, God. We're marching around this obstacle. And with our hands open and our heart open, inside we're singing and praising, hoping that you're going to crumble this wall. It could be a medical issue. It could be a financial issue. It could be a relational issue. It could be a security issue. It could be a fear issue. It could be a love issue. Forgiveness. You go through the list. Lord, we all have walls. And so in faith, we say thank you in advance for the hope that we have that you're at work even if we can't see it. Jesus, that you're work at work behind the scenes, even when we're unaware. And we look forward to the day in faith when the walls will come, come tumbling down. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Would you say amen? Amen. Would you stand please and keep your palms open? I want to offer you one final blessing. Brothers and sisters, rest in the assurance that God is with you, He is for you, and He is going ahead of you. And He's going to work through you. Sometimes in what seems very insignificant ways. And so as you leave here today, and as you go about your day, Be Jesus' hands and feet with your smiles and with your greetings and with your generosity as you do the little things well, knowing that God's going to use you not only to break down the walls in your own life, but to help break down the walls in other people's life. You are his hands and feet. So I bless you today with an overwhelming sense of his presence and his spiritual authority in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Sing and shout, amen and amen and amen. God bless you, everybody.